Hey, good evening. Uh, I don't see anybody yet, but I'm sure somebody will show up in a minute. Um, here to read the book, Champion of the Golden Queen again. Here it is. This is the second edition, the cleaner edition, and my name is right on the bottom down here, Austin Belanger. That's me. All right. Um, I read this every Wednesday night from 7 to 9 p.m. until the book's read. We are literally this far into the book, so you can see what that is. Uh, that means we don't have too much left to go. So tonight we're going to read three chapters, and we're going to get into the climax of the story and actually reveal some stuff about some characters that are main characters that we've been talking about and building up uh, throughout the book. Uh, basically, tonight is uh, well half of the rest of the book. Uh, news for the new book. Hey, what's up, Eric? Nice to see you, man. Thanks for coming. Uh, the new book is uh, due out any day now. I'm waiting on a couple of uh, uh, adjustments to the cover. Once the cover is adjusted properly and everything's great, I'll be uploading it onto Ingram Spark, and hopefully within a few days it'll be available on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble, etc. Bookfinder.com for anyone overseas that's reading the book. Uh, you can get it probably within uh, probably in a week. So it'll officially be launched on the 26th if I ever get this paperwork done properly. Uh, if not, it'll the date might slide a little bit, but I'm trying to get it done by the end of the month. That is my, uh, hey, how's the sequel? Can't wait for the sequel. Yep, um, I can't either. It's it's almost done. I mean, I literally was looking at a couple of small errors here and there. <laughs> well, you know, I would have to speak Spanish better to write it in Spanish. Maybe you could translate it and we can republish it. But I have to have somebody watch you because I know you. You you put some interesting dialogue in there that I didn't write. And I'll be like, what is he talking about? But anyway, yeah, I don't think that's what it says in Spanish. But anyway, so anyway. Uh, so looks like we might be uh, a little lean on folks tonight. It's kind of a shame because this is where the story gets actually pretty exciting. Um, so anyway, I'm going to start on the story. Uh, me and looks like me and uh, Barrera are going to be here today by ourselves, unless some other folks decide to show up. If not... I'll read it and people can catch up with it on uh, on YouTube or back here. All right. So the last chapter we read was, um, let me see, uh, The Lull and the Forest Queen where Adasser figures out that she's going to be the holy mother of the trees and she doesn't realize it yet and she's kind of stressed out about it and she goes back to Torth to figure out what's going on. All right. Now uh, we're going to shift gears and go towards the uh, Sudanyag where the offlanders... Uh, the offlanders have been landing their ships and dropping their troops off into Sudanyag, which is the beginning stuff. Hey, Mary, what's going on? Uh, so basically, the Sudanyag folks have been inundated with these offlander folks that their king has made friends with to trade with so he can get rich and he doesn't really care what the rest of the world says. And uh, he's not listening to King Swick up in this land. He doesn't care what the other kings say. He thinks he can do whatever he wants. And technically he can, but... His actions will have repercussions. Hey, uh, so anyway, we're at a point now where Adasser and, and Purin have visited Torith. She's figured out she's got some training to do because she's taking over as the Holy Mother um, and for the elves. And, well, she's kind of overwhelmed. So anyway, I'll start with this one. The next chapter is called The Offlander Threat. It's a short one. We have two big chapters after that. I'm going to try to do three chapters tonight. So The Offlander Threat. From the beginning, Hildren reviled the light and held a great animosity toward the family who abandoned him in Eternum. For a time, the god sat alone in the darkness of his own creation. With his, he was lonely in his solitude, so he, began, he created beings of death and darkness to worship him and be his companions. These creatures are known to those on the earth as the Denier, or the keepers of the gates of the underworld, doers of mischief to any soul unfortunate enough to enter into their realm. <clears throat> the denier may take physical form, but it is not uh, so. It was not so from the beginning. Even with the power uh, the, to exist in the physical world, they preferred to remain spirits, which were capable capable of concealment in dark corners of any abode. This preference is the reason for the chill that runs down a, a victim's spine when an unsuspecting soul crosses their path during their daily routine. The denier are devoted servants of the underlord Hildren and they serve his desire to subjugate, dominate, and destroy the light. 
They are bringers of pestilence, violence, death, and ruin to any place where they are allowed to remain. These servants tend to migrate to any locale where the hearts are focused on the darkness, self-interest, or show a rebellion towards the light. Denier consider anyone who has this predisposition as fair game, working to pervert the victim's desires to suit their master's will. After Haldrin created the darkness and his followers, he looked outside of his realm at all the light and life Haya had created. He realized the abundance that was allowed to flourish in his absence. The more the light and life existed, the angry he, angrier he became. Surveying the entire earth until he found a barren and miserable wasteland, Haldrin decided to create his own perversion of Haya's world. He named, he named it the Wargurn, fashioning it into a place of suffering and despair. Haldrin used his denier to protect his new domain. They were sent out to confuse the few sailing vessels that happened to travel towards the, his new lands in an effort to, keep, to maintain secrecy. The god then cast a spell of protection over the land, creating a shield of darkness, which would not allow those of, of Eternum to detect the presence of his new endeavor. Hey, Daryl, what's happening, bro? Haya and their children, Haya and their children did not notice Haldren's evil intentions. Because ironically, even when Haldrin didn't influence the affairs of the light, mortals always found a reason to bicker and to kill each other. The, this carnage pleased the god of the underworld, and although the, these petty conflicts never quite extinguished the light, they kept Haya occupied and focused elsewhere. Her intervention saved her precious life and hid the coming darkness. As Haya's light grew, so did her power. She became confident and complacent. Haldrin watched from the dark, his darkness as his former love became blinded. He smiled when she began to doubt that he was interested in creating much mischief. Haldrin maintained a low profile, straightening his strengthening his wife's belief that all was well and continued his plans from the shadows. While Haya tended her mortal children, Haldrin launched his plans. His first order of business was to create his own army of abominations. He chose to pervert the races of the earth, starting with mankind. In contrast to Haya's use of two elements, Haldrin created these mortals from fire alone. His men and women were belligerent, warlike, suspicious, and prone to violence. He made them lust after one another, and they procreated, multiplying throughout the Borgern. Eventually, they fought, killing each other over the meager resources Haldrin uh, provided to support life. I'm clicking here, sorry. Uh, Haldrin named these beings Todesen. The Todesen evolved into fierce warriors over time, bickering over mates, land, re and resources and power. There was no end to their debauchery, and Haldrin fed this evil with all the strife and despair the Worgen provided. Later, it would be rumored that the, by Eden scribes that the Todesen were habitual eaters of their own kind. This creation quickly became the favorite pastime of Haldrin, and he loved them in his own vile way. Next, Haldrin perverted the elves, naming them the Harkel. When they were vaguely elf-like and pale-skinned with oversized eyes meant for seeing better in the darkness of catacombs and dark places, Haldrin's Harkel hated forests and growing things unless they were provided as food or drink by the, uh, the god of the underworld. The god gave them several rows of sharp, sharp, sharp teeth and claws with which to rip uh, living things apart. Harkel enjoyed eating their prey alive, never feeling remorse for killing anything living. They harvested the, the few trees of the Wargurn burning them for warmth, and never gave a thought to the needs of tomorrow. These beings preferred to dwell in the, within canyons, feeding upon anything foolish enough to wander into their territory. Finally, the Underlord perverted the race of the dwarves by creating the cavern. The god created the cavern much like the dwarves of the earth, except they were hairless, wrinkly, uh, wrinkly skinned, and pale. They, had hu they too had huge eyes, but none of the sharp teeth of the Harkle. The cavern instead possessed the most strength and durability of any of the races of the Wargurn. Haldrin placed them in the caves and underground tunnels located within the mountains of dark, his dark continent. They, there they sca scavenged food from what they could find, killing unsuspecting wildlife or an occasional unfortunate, pa un unfortunate passerby. The cavern were secretive and preferred dark places. This, Hild this pleased Haldrin, and he increased their numbers 100-fold. Finally, Haldrin ensured that his creations could communicate freely with the tribes of the earth by endowing them with the knowledge of the land, language of Etah. The god made communication easier with, it, with his future allies or captured slaves by allowing his creations and knowledge of the most common tongue of the earth. <coughs> the kingdom of the earth 
the kingdoms of the earth were not even in highest dreams at the time of the organ's development. Most tribes of the earth were barely established, and wars were still rare in highest realm because of the abundance of land and resources. This was not so on the wargern. Haldren had created his lands to be a crucible used to purify his creations. He sought to create the army to end all light, and his plans were done as a god would prefer, gradually, with intention, and over the long run. I'm just clicking to make sure maybe that I got some uh, traffic on this thing so it doesn't cut my camera off. At least I can see myself this week, unlike last week where I couldn't see anything. All right, back to the story. In the desolation that was the Wargurn, desperate beings fought over every scrap of food, drop of water, and piece of territory. Haldren kept them at each other's throats by providing only resources for half of those whom he had created. The urgency that this shortfall included forced all life to provide for their own needs by violence and coercion, and it kept the whole world on edge and in constant state of uh, in this constant state of conflict. Haldren was pleased because this chaos honed the lethality and cruelty of his creations, but he was not completely satisfied with the end result. Uh, that what with what the end result was becoming. Over time, the Tedesan developed martial arts that rivaled all the others. They were proficient in killing with an open hand, and they were as they, they were as proficient in killing with an open hand as they were with any implement or weapon. Tedesan were fierce warriors who fought with, in large bands. They were prone to use superior numbers to overpower better equipped enemies through violence and brute force. The Harkel built small sa sailing vessels, eventually developing larger ships. They were formidable foes in their own right, but preferred to skulk around in the shadows, stealing what they could find. They preferred to engage the weaker stragglers from any of the opposing tribes of the Wargurn. The Harkel were considered to be cowards by the other factions of the Darklands, but in reality, they were of the highest intelligence and knew how to fight and when to flee. Their descendants would eventually discover how to navigate by use of the stars when Haldren eventually allowed the skies to be seen by his creations eons later. The Cavern became miners and, ma and blacksmiths. They created the first metal weapons, and they were the first to tame the, to tame the advances of the Todesin. The Gavern were an even match for the Todesin due to their incredible strength and the skill with superior weaponry. Eventually, the Todesin learned to avoid the, the Cavern warrior class or bring larger numbers due to their proficiency in warfare and martial combat. The Gavern eventually invented, invented the first body armor, dominating the Wargurn through its use. Haldren looked upon what he had created and was still not satisfied. He wanted them to be more formidable. Although his former love's world was a place of light and pr the prowess of a combined Islandith, Hodon, Torith, and Dornad Alar still concerned him. Eons had, eons had passed and the Earth's kingdoms were starting to strengthen. He knew he, had, he needed to push his plan a little further if it was to be successful. That is when he thought of using about using the denier. It was at this time that Haldren first gave the denier their ability to take physical form in the mortal world. The denier were already masters of reading the innermost needs and desires of any mortal being. They would use this knowledge to manipulate and coerce the, the living to, into doing things they would not normally do, be willing to do. Haldren counted on these abilities. The Todesin were resistant to the coercion of the denier. Haldren surmised that it had something to do with their anger and depravity. It made them unable to, to care about temptation or offer of emotional bribes. They already took what they wanted. They were, they, their fire elemental souls burned too hot and angry to interest the denier. So the deceivers went on to the other races and found much easier candidates for perversion. Haldren chuckled when he heard the reports of the denier and figured at, that at least one of his races was apparently ready. The denier went to the Harkle first, promising strength and prowess. The deceivers came to the Dark Elves as beautiful creatures. They seduced them into unnatural relationships and created offspring with many of the Harkel. The bastardization of the races <clears throat> created the first orcs of the Wargurn. At first, the Harkel were appalled at what they had done, but eventually, when the first generation of orcs came of age, they changed their minds completely. The resulting orcs were seven to eight feet tall. They were taller than any race that had been seen on the Wargurn. The orcs also had the strength of two cavern and were at, of average intelligence. Soon, eligible Harkel sought out Denier imposters for mates, hoping to create children who would elevate their tribe to dominance, and the orcs thrived for a time. The Denier also went to the cavern and did similarly. The cavern were also duped into taking on Denier imposters as mates, creating their own hybrid children 
uh, generation of children. The result of the cavern and the denier union produced the first goblin races of the wargern. The goblins were wiry, but very muscular, four to six feet tall and fast. They were not quite as strong as the orcs of the cavern, but these beings made up for their inadequacies in speed and agility. An orc and a, and a an orc and goblin encounter often ended with both sides dead. Goblins, although smaller and weaker, had already learned to even the odds with the use of swords or spears and by adopting the practice of wearing body armor. Through technology, they became the equals of their rivals, the orcs. Haldrin watched from the underworld as the earth took up arms once again against his brothers. The kingdoms finally established their borders and a tentative peace reigned for many years, save for the occasional skirmish or battle that marred the silence and harmony. Simultaneously, he watched as the wargern writhed in discord and suffering. The new races slowly dominated and extinguished the ancestral lines of the Cavern and Harkel. The only remaining original people were the Todesan, and they were as evil as ever. Haldren finally intervened, increasing the provisions found within the misery he had created. The god ordered the Denier, who had returned, uh, who had returned to being hidden spirits, to coerce the remaining races of the Wargern. Hey, what's up, Dave? Hope everything's going good, dude. I know you've been dealing with some stuff. Uh, the Denier sought to have all races put aside their former differences and form bonds of friendship and alliance. Crops grew. Uh, resources flourished, and every race over the next few millennia flourished in peace. The Denier influenced the orcs and goblins to create new military technologies, as well as great ships for exploration. In their hearts, all the races of the Wargren desired, desired to find a new place to conquer and dominate, and they in, united together as one army. Death was part of their souls, and now they were of one dangerously lethal mind. So Haldren looked upon his creation and was satisfied he had, with what he had was satisfied that he had finally created the massive lethal army which was capable was capable of wiping out all the light of the earth and he pushed his plan uh, he pushed to move his plan along after creating his races uniting the clans and enhancing their technology and weaponry Haldren finally revealed the, the stars to the goblin sailors the descendant of the Harkel created instruments by which they could navigate the open seas and sail far from their own shores the races of the wargern created massive black ships with which to cross the open seas. They brought along provisions for themselves and cages for future prisoners, setting off to unknown places for the sole purpose of war. Haldren first directed their forces to unknown lands inhabited by primitive followers of, fo followers of Haya. Most were humans and elves who were unknown, who were unknown to the races of the earth. Their tribes were isolated and ill-prepared for the onslaught that came onslaught ill-prepared for the onslaught that came their way. Haldren had watched over the eons and knew of the location of Haya's expansions and all of her attempts to expand the light uh, uh, the light and her sphere of influence. The god had been watching and cataloging these smaller continents, determining which would give his followers the years of practice necessary before he finally decided to reveal the location of his ultimate prize, the Earth. When Haldren finally allowed his creation to find the Earth, he figured they had sufficient numbers and experience to accomplish his will. He was, how, he was, however, worried that the Earth may prove too well defended to barge in with a full force frontal attack. On the gods' behalf, the Denier spoke quietly to the leadership of the orcs and the goblins, imploring them to use subterfuge and quietly invade. They quietly allied with the humans of the south, so as not to awaken the warriors of the immense new island they had just found. The scouts, uh, scouts were also dropped off in remote locations. Their reports stated that they had never seen anything like the advanced civilizations of Islandeth, Sinog, Edenyog, Sudnyog, or Hodon. Haldren knew that these people might not have seafaring vessels, but the god was concerned at the potential that uh, potential might that Hodon or Islandeth might was capable of projecting with, on his forces within days. The god was unaware that during that his distraction, while preparing his forces for invasion, the whole of the earth had just concluded a major war among all of the people. His fear of vast numbers were unfounded. His forces befriended the Sudanyag crown with the help of the Denier. His forces made reconnaissance, which told his commanders that the earth was virtually defenseless in comparison to the invading forces. Haldren was emboldened by these reports and pushed his creations into Sudanyag, confident of victory. 
but in his arrogance he hadn't noticed that Haya had heard the cries of her conquered people outside of the Urt. Quietly, years prior, she had made her own plans to intervene and save the Urt. Haldron was, was known for his subterfuge, but Haya was now showing him up at his own game. Where Haldron saw only numbers and strength, Haya saw covert opportunities to respond to her husband's incursions into her realm. Haldron, in his anger and jealousy, had seemingly forgotten who he was dealing with. <coughs> so Haldron fed the Sudan fears of invasion, allowing his children to infiltrate the Sudan Yacht capital. <coughs> Excuse me. He relished the fact that he no longer had to work to cultivate the fear in Sudan of being conquered from the north. Sudanyak had will, willingly allowed its conquerors to walk in from the sea. He loved their fearful, fearful faces and tears of regret. Sudan had not always Sudan had not always been wise, but they were still high as children. <coughs> Excuse me, I gotta take a drink of water, I guess. <clears throat> I'm here choking. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sudan had not always been wise, but they were still high as children. Hildern didn't realize that the goddess had been lying in wait for him. It was unclear. It was unclear of the end game of this encounter, but she would give her a strange husband all he could handle and more. All right, that was the first chapter that was called the Offlander Threat. So it explains where these Offlanders came from. They came from a place called the Wargern, and Haldren created them, which is kind of ironic in <coughs> that he is the god of death, but he created his own life. He said, "Okay, well, I'm going to take what Haya did and twist it." and turn it into a killing machine. And now he's got his killing machine going to other little lands, you know, smaller islands, instead of going to this big continent of the earth. He went to the smaller continents and was killing off these people and enslaving them to give these guys practice, you know, kind of like when we go out to war, the Marines will we'll go over and practice, you know, attacking little small islands and do maneuvers. Well, they were doing it, except they were really a taking over. Excuse me, I got the hiccups. They were really taking over these small places and uh, pretty much enslaving them all. So now they've invaded Sudanyag, which we saw in uh, oh, some of the prior chapters where Yanar Alar, the king of Sudan, had let them in. They just you know, rolled in their ships and started unloading troops. So thousands of them are sitting in Sudanyag right now. And this uh, it, it, now we're going to go forward. That was uh, like way back. It went back thousands of years. Showed how these people were created and where they came from. And they went in, now they're in Sudanyag, and that's where that chapter ended, and we're back to Sudanyag. All right, <clears throat> so the second chapter is called Trouble from the South, and I'll go ahead and start reading that one. We're doing pretty good on time. It's only been about 23 minutes, so I might actually get this done. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know what my problem is. I'm choking on my own spit. <clears throat> it's been a cold going around. It's terrible. All right, so, trouble from the south. Sudanyag was effectively saturated with offlander forces. <clears throat> the king pre pretended to be sovereign, but he knew he had lost control months ago. Peace had now reigned for six years, but Yanat knew it was only a matter of time before all of that changed. The people of Sudanyag turned a blind eye to the peaceful invasion of their lands because their occupiers up until now allowed them to continue life as usual, and their businesses were booming. Sudan was enriched in all things. The kingdom's wealth was the envy of all the earth. Some, however, thought privately that this may be the fattening before the slaughter. Thousands slipped to the northwest, hiding in the forested mountains on the hodon Sinog border, in efforts to form a secret underground. There they used their contacts within the Sudanyag, within Sudanyag to appropriate supplies and weapons. This rebellion boasted some of the best leaders in Sudan who trained their meager forces to the best of their abilities. Still, they were an ill-equipped, poorly trained force with, which was low on supplies. <coughs> the rebellion set up a nomadic system to thwart detection by, uh, by their adversary. Splitting into several smaller groups, they sought to avoid in, an entire force being captured at once. The tactics were sound, but their worries were unproved unfounded. Sudanyag was more concerned about internal affairs. The majority of the populace scarcely, scarcely acknowledged the forces in the mountains, and those who did kept it to themselves, hoping that perhaps the rebels would prove to be their saviors. <clears throat> Yanot, King Yanot sat on his throne, fiddling with a large ruby-encrusted ring on his finger. He wondered about it for his future. The offlanders brought a large contingent of peacekeepers to the land, including a leader known as Magrat, 
Magritte the Conqueror, who had begun to assert his political power in, his, in the palace. Yana, you will need, we will need more food and shelter for my soldiers. You will provide homes or shelter in homes immediately. <clears throat> uh, the Conqueror spoke with authority. He was no longer asking. I have no homes to spare, my lord, but if it pleases you, I can arrange my, for my stewards to provide as many tents as our military supplies contain. <clears throat> Yana nodded. As if he were doing the orc a favor, the orc was not impressed. Beware, little human. I have no use for the, your platitudes and trickery. I care not for the for where the homes come from, but they will be, be provided by nightfall, or I'll take this castle from beneath your ass. The, the orc approached the king, and two student spearmen pointed their spears at the orc's throat. Chuckling, Margaret sneered. He let out a war cry, and the spearmen backed up in fear. Such pathetic warriors. We chose a perfect point with which to set our beachhead. One of the orc's advisors shook his head, looking at the orc, and made a quiet sign with his hand. The orc rolled his eyes. Do you think this one is stupid, Gulag? He has he has been posturing and calculating our strength for over a year. He knows he is lost. This is all for show. Why do we play this game? <clears throat> Gulag whispered in, in his ear, and Margaret sighed. You've become soft, brother. These humans are pathetic. This whole continent is ripe for the taking. Margaret... I a tapestry which showed the kingdoms of the earths while smiling an evil grin. Gulag only nodded and then patted away uh, in his well-worn leather boots. As a team, as a team, the two had killed so many that they thought of victories in terms of nations, vice people, and money. To them, it was a foregone conclusion that the earth was had already lost. The student protested the invasion of their homes. Every every being who stood up to the offlanders was executed on the spot. Yanat sat in fear and wondered when his turn would come. Resistance forces lurked out, out of plain sight on the, aid, on the edge of the capital and were gathering intelligence for their units in the, in the hills. Still, they, uh, no, excuse me, there they witnessed the carnage of the peacekeepers firsthand. In an effort to pass, out, to pass on the intelligence they had gathered, the rebel scouts scurried northwest one of their, uh, to one of their preset rally points. There they found a large contingent of forces camping. There were approximately 500 spearmen and 100 archers. Captain Harun, they're murdering the civilians, and Yanat sits and trembles in his own piss, the scout reported. It figures that man's not worth the, the horse dung on my shoe, Harun spat. This cannot stand. There are too many, my captain, the scout replied, looking at the angry faces before him. The scout knew that he was not going to win this fight. Many of these men had fought Eslandif and Edenyag in the last war, surviving to tell the tale. Yana had let them uh, had let them left them to fend for themselves on both occasions. One or more, one or two claimed to have survived Antok's charge on the Arendir almost eight years ago. No one could confirm their stories because there were no other survivors. These men desired blood for the civilian deaths and knew y King Yana would simply roll over to his keepers like the coward he was. All right, I'm clicking on something so that I keep the. Uh, traffic and I'm gonna say hi just to keep the traffic going so that this thing doesn't kick me off so how all right the offlander forces were overconfident they did not set a watch over the city wall so the rebels used the night as cover to sneak in undetected moving swiftly over common terrain they were able to enter the palace courtyard without detection the entire units crept stealthily to the palace doors the rebels became confident thinking that the, their enemy was foolishly dismissing their abilities and began to move at will you can, began moving at will along the borders of Sudanyak. That is when things changed drastically. The goblin guard detected the unit in the open. It was obvious because the rebels were not trying to hide with much effort. They instead focused on speed and surprise. The sentry sounded the alarm, bringing the, the evening guard of 20 orc warriors to the, to the yard. It was a challenge for the unproven student rebels, even though they, had out, they outnumbered the orcs 30 to 1. <laughs> Many of the rebels had never held a, a weapon in combat. Some fled and others froze. Captain Harun Il Il Arnat uh, <clears throat> barked out orders to his remaining soldiers, and they were baptized in battle, destroying the first enemy unit sac successfully. Rebel casualties were light, and they made their way to the throne room unopposed. There they were greeted by Commander Margaret and Gulag, who were taunting the king. Harun led his rebels into the chamber. He immediately charged forward, swinging his glaive with a wide arc. Die, you abominable scum. As Gulag turned, his head was neatly severed from his shoulders, leaving, having been caught by surprise by the human. Margaret was enraged. No, Gulag, my brother, you human filth. Margaret 
charged the captain, throwing him into the nearest wall. Wooden shelves splintered as Harun fell to the floor. Margaret turned, focusing on the human who was trying to collect himself and stand. The orc roared loudly to the chirping response of thousands off in the distance. Several hundred student spearmen now crowded the ten-foot-wide entryway to the throne room, room in, pre in preparation for the thousands of Othlanders who they knew were pouring in from every corner of the capital. On the other side of the large room, twenty of the rebels attacked Margaret. The orc disemboweled one of the men, toying with the rest who dared to face him in, uh, to face him in combat. Angered by the lack of chivalry and decency, Harun struck again with his glaive while the orc was distracted. The orc's head hit the floor with, a, with the sound of an overripe melon uh, cantaloupe. It's a melon cantaloupe, whatever. Uh, they, the rebels cheered half-heartedly, and some now angrily stared at their king. Wait now, men. I'm still your king. Put down your arms. We, go we must neg negotiate with them. They are too strong, and they cannot win. I will get the king stopped mid-sentence by a glaive blade to the throat. The captain looked at him in disgust. Sudanyag falls for your lust and greed. We are ruined, and our families are forfeit for your se selfish amb ambitions. Die and go to the underworld, never to, a see, to see a turnum, you pile of dung. Shortly thereafter, the rebels also put the queen to death by decapitation as she begged for her life. Their mission was an apparent success. Outside, deep-toned horns, deep horns blew. The castle was quickly becoming surrounded by a sea of offlanders. Quickly, take the heads of the orcs. We must, he must be the commander, and the other, he was a minister or an aide. We must take, we need proof to take to hold on. This is going to end badly. The king, the captain looked at his, his men. Some frowned and some were crying. Others, uh, but some, everyone stood their ground now, knowing there was no place left to run. <laughs> One of the survivors of the Erendere stepped forward and spoke. Run, sir, run and get free of here. Take the evidence. Our people will suffer dearly for what we have done, but it was necessary. Do not squander their deaths. I will not forget this day until I enter a turnum. Save a place for me at the hero's table, my brother. The captain's voice wavered as he turned to find an open, darkened passageway in the nearby sleeping quarters of the king. It led to the outside walls. Harun hoped there were no guards. I will pour a cup of the finest ale for you, sir, the soldier waved and then turned to meet his doom. The battle was over within minutes, but the captain successfully escaped out of the castle walls and into the forest with his grisly prize of two bloody orc heads, making his way back and forth in the trees until the, he was sure that he was not followed. He made his way to another predetermined meeting place high on the mountain. Looking over his shoulder as he ran, Harun saw Sudanyag in flames, the sound of distant screams emanating from every corner of the city. He wondered if he had made the right choice, but knew it was too late to go back and change things now. Up in the mountains, the rebel units were on high alert. Harun approached an edgy guard on the perimeter of the camp who nearly ran him through. Hold there, soldier. It is I, the captain yelled. The soldier stood down. Sorry, sir. With all the fire and smoke, I was unsure of what was happening. It is the worst, my boy. We accomplished our, the objective, but we were discovered and in the process killed a couple of important enemy leaders. Unfortunately, the enemy is raising our city in retaliation. I am sure that sure many Sudan are losing their lives. We must leave for Hodon immediately. The captain looked over the mountains at the glowing horizon. They were coming now, and no one was safe. The Ert needed to know. The unit packed their meager belongings and headed northwest towards the Alabaster Sands Cas uh, Canyon, and then changed direction north as they rode directly into Hodon territory. Not long after passing the border, they were challenged and captured by, a Hodon, by the Hodon military. Hodon put 300, the 300 remaining Sudan warriors in chains except for the Sudan captain. The Hodon waited for arrival of King Oris, who would be notified of the situation. The Hodon commander of the patrol questioned the Sudan captain. Why are you here, Sudan dog? I come here as a, war a warning from Sudanyag. We must alert the Northern Alliance of, uh, to the coming onslaught. The captain was frank frantic. I have proof, Hodon, if you will allow it. He reached for his bag. The Hodon commander drew his sword. Carefully and slowly, Sudan, or you will be run through where you stand. Agreed, Harun said, putting his hands up. And then he undid the twine on the top of the burlap sack, dropping the heads out in the Hodon commander's feet. The Hodon man did not flinch, but did a double take when he saw the faces of those heads. Are those orcs, he questioned? Yes, commander, they are, the captain responded emphatically. How did you come by these heads, Sudan? the commander asked suspiciously. I collected them personally, Harun said smugly. What is going on in Sudan, Yog dog? Tell me now. The Hodon commander grabbed the captain forcefully and pulled him close to his face. Start talking or I'll make you talk. Harun scowled and pushed the commander's hands away. There is no need for that. We came to you. I will tell you. The Hodon commander relaxed his stance and listened. 
For a year or two, maybe two, our illustrious former king made an alliance with the offlanders to counter the northern alliance. The commander picked up on the fact that the captain had referred to King Yanat in the past tense and as the man went on. Yanat sold us out to save his own skin because he feared the wrath of Hodon and its allies. allies. He made a deal with the evil you see before you. Over the past two years, ships have come and deposited thousands of these vermin in our land. They move in, take our homes, and enslave our people. Yanat tolerated these atrocities because the invaders allowed him and his horde to sit upon the thrones of Sudan, playing royalty, while the offlanders' armies took what they pleased from the rest of us. The captain spat. We sought to scout the area and see how bad the infiltration and abuses had become, but our missions evolved into a coup when we witnessed civilian executions. In the process, we succeeded in killing two of the orc leaders. Apparently, they were well-liked, or at least well-connected, because my unit perished holding off the hordes, so I could come here, I could return here, return to our base. I took these heads as proof. The armies of these two ravaged the port of Valon, taking whatever or whoever they pleased. He looked at the heads on the ground. We are begging for your help, and I wish to warn of their coming. They will not stop at Sunyag. You can be assured of that. <clears throat> hey. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, Tommy, what's happening, man? An interesting story. We shall see what King Oris thinks of it. Put your heads back in the bag and set them somewhere, somewhere for safekeeping. They may save your life yet. The Hodon commander turned, calling for the watch. The watch commander set up a perimeter around the encampment, using the legion at his disposal. Still, the commander kept his remaining forces vigilant, not giving in to the false sense of security. The night was moonless and cold and damp. The guards were uneasy. More, most believed the student captain's story, and it did not bode well for the Urt. The Hodon woke to smoke in hazy conditions. Many of the experienced soldiers, old, experienced older warriors, recognized the unmistakable smell of a burning village or town. It wasn't a clean wood smell, but the smell of a civilization on fire. The Hodon Legion, as well trained and prepared for battle, the Hodon Legion was well trained and prepared for battle, even though his, this generation had never fought a true enemy. The commander knew it would be days before their king returned, if at all, so he ordered his men to set in battle, in battlements as best they could, and the men dug in, all dug, dug in for defense. Watching the smoke rise, they waited for their king or the enemy to arrive, whichever came first. I'm clicking for a second. I'm back. The student lived in terror. The offlanders assumed control of the palace and burned, the, and burned entire neighborhoods in affluent sections of the capital port city. Rape, murder, and mayhem were, were rampant as offlanders wantonly abused the population, stealing any material wealth they desired. In some cases... In some extreme cases, there were reports of cannibalization. The orcs and goblins considered human flesh a delicacy, and the Todesan would eat anyone or anything according to Edenyog's scrolls. The enemy army erected, a, erected large iron cages in the city square where imprisoned people who they randomly selected to join their slave... Uh, uh, where they imprisoned people so they ran, who they randomly selected to join their slave labor pool. Okay, I can't speak English again. Okay, except for the port, Sudnyag was in ruins. Thousands of troops now freely and disembarked from countless ships at the piers wait, while waiting vessels stretched off into the horizon. People hid their children in root cellars, praying for mercy, but apparently Hyo was busy elsewhere. Haldron rubbed his hands together in anticipation. All of his long pre preparation was about to make his dream of extinguishing the light true. He reveled in, result, in the resulting death and despair. The rebellion was still that was left behind in Sudan totaled maybe 150 souls. They snuck back into the city, making contact in clandestine locations with anyone who could be trusted. The network of agents was created. A network of agents was created in an effort to quietly smuggle women and children out of Sudan. Their plan seemed to work, but with their limited resources, very few made it out alive. However, the network saved as many as it could. On the pier, a new commander arrived with a cohort of young, eager, eager lieutenants. They seemed new to war and very idealistic. They were not jaded like Gulag and Margaret were. Soldiers, come here. Soldier, come here, the new commander called. Yes, sir, the young orc answered. How may I be of service? Get the slaves to unload our supplies and get a slave crew to clean this mess. Tell these idiots that we strive to take this land, not raise it to the ground. Stop burning the buildings, imbeciles. 
I will relate this to the captain, sir, the soldier replied respectfully. 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 Woo. You do that. Where is the captain, Orc? The captain, the commander growled. He's up in the castle, sir, upon the hill. The, the soldier pointed at the palace. The new commander and his cohort traveled to the palace and found the newly, com uh, newly commissioned captain. He was having his way with one of the ladies in waiting for the former queen, and it was not consensual. She was crying and begging for him to stop. He did, killing her with his bare hands for good measure. Getting up, he saw the new commander. Oh, well, plenty more of where that came from, he chuckled. Sir, the city is secured. I can see that, Captain. What of the continent? The commander seemed impatient. Sir, we have gathering the forces and logistics required for the main offensive. It will be a week or so before that it, it can begin. The captain looked at the, com the new commander as if he should already know how this went. Do not attempt to lecture me or I will take your head next, the commander leaned forward and, and attempted to impose his authority, but the captain was clearly not impressed. As you wish, sir, the captain replied, walking away, calling for his aides. The leaders uh, discussed logistics and planning. After an hour, the aides left the captain uh, to carry out his orders. Uh, returning to, to the, the commander, who was now guzzling ale out of a small keg, the captain reported, the plans have been related to the leadership, sir. My cohort is dis dispatching the orders and arranging for the deployment of our forces. Very good, the commander waved him off uh, as if sh shooing a fly. Visibly annoyed, the captain sneered as he left the commander. We shall utterly defeat these weaklings, and they shall serve us as slaves or lose their lives. Humans are so weak. The commander's cohort laughed uh, as, they, as they celebrated on y King Yanak's stores. Yanat's body was still on the floor, and it was barely cold. <clears throat> it had been three days, and, Hodon's, and the Hodon encampment now resembled a battlefield emplacement. The Legion was now closely monitoring the hanging smoke and haze as it wafted towards them from the southwest when they saw the first intruders making their way up the mountainsides. Hold your fire, Hodon, the student captain begged. They are refugees, not soldiers. The Hodon still stood on full alert. They did not trust the student, and it was difficult to tell who was coming through the haze. Eventually, a small girl and her family materialized into full view. The refugees were in shock, looking as if they had passed through a war zone, but Hodon still gruffly took them into custody. As they arrested the first arrivals, more began to show up, as if from nowhere out of the smoke. Suddenly, the field was filled with civilians who were carrying what they could on their backs. Children were weeping quietly, some grasping dolls or small pets. Their clothes were ragged and filthy, and they looked as if they had walked for several days without sleep. They were not trained for, the, for it. Even the hardened Hodon warriors stopped and looked at their commander. Set up the canvas. Get the children under cover. Distribute aid as we can. Get the water wagon over here, the commander yelled as he directed traffic. Thank you for your kindness, Commander. Captain Haroon fought back the tears as he saw the shell-shocked faces, children's faces. Some said nothing, but their blank stares screamed very loudly. We know what it is to be desperate, Sudan, the commander said, sadly thinking of his own family who had braved three winters on sawdust and grass soups. He remembered eating his own horse after the first snows. The student captain was taken aback by the look of sympathy on the Hodon's face. While settling, and seeming, settling the seemingly endless flow of refugees, there was another disturbance from the north watch, but this one was ex expected. It was Oris, king of Hodon, arriving with a messenger who had summoned him. The commander ran to greet his king. He bowed, saluting, Hail, Oris, king of the Hodon, may you... May you always be well, and may your enemies be crushed before you. The king saluted in return, dismounting his horse. What is it that brings me this far south, Commander? Uh, let me go. Sudanyag, your majesty. It burns, and according to reports, the offlanders bring an army that threatens us all. This is the report of a Sudan captain. He brought with him proof within his burlap sack. The heads of two orc commanders, which he, the rebels killed on a mission that ended the reign of King Yanat Elanar. <clears throat> the commander crossed his arms. They were quite busy, Your Majesty, but it seems they riled a, wa a wasp's nest in the process. Who are these civilians? The king asked in dismay. Sudan? Yes, sire. Refugees escaping the atrocities at the hands of orcs and goblins. Orcs? Has anyone seen an orc or a goblin in a thousand years? The king was not convinced. He continued. Next you will be telling me that you have found a dragon. Oris chuckled but stopped abruptly, realizing the commander was serious. Show me. The two walked over to the student captain, where Oris then demanded to see the orc heads. The captain produced them as ordered. My gods, they are orc heads. At least I think they are. My father spoke to, spoke of their evil. They have not been seen on the earth for at least a thousand years, maybe 1,500 years. Where did they come from? Ships, your majesty, the student captain replied. 
they have been invading our kingdom for almost two years now. They, they've been invading, yeah, invading our kingdom for almost two years now. They are in, we are inundated with their kind. We sought to topple our king and inspire our populace to fight back, but it did not go as planned. Instead, they hid, and the enemy raised our city and did God's know what to the to our to the people who resisted. The captain looked physically ill. Look at all of these children. Where are their parents? The king surveyed this tactic. Surveyed the tactical uh, uh, situation. We cannot stay here. This area is indefensible. We are exposed. How many of the enemy soldiers are there? Estimate, man. He looked at Harun for an answer. Truly, I cannot count that many, Your Majesty. Perhaps hundreds of thousands. And some report that ships are coming with more soldiers as we sit here. The ships wait to dock at the port. The line extends until one cannot see them. Harun was worried. After a couple of days, the stream of refugees stopped. The student captain figured the resistance had been discovered or betrayed by someone selling them out to save his or her own skin. This number was all of his all of ugh, this number was all his men would save. Uh, all that was left of Sudan were two or three thousand men, women, and children. None of the old made it out over the hills. The majority of the survivors were children without parents. <laughs> it was late, and we brought some. It was late, and we brought supplies. Send out hunters for deer, or uh, and uh, or elk. We will feed these people. We will make the trip up. We will uh, we will meet up with Purin to devise a plan. I do not know what kind of plan there is to devise. But devise one we will. We will not lie down and die without a fight. We will set a wagon train and march the Sudan to Irinsir. It will take several days, I am sure. But what else can we do? The king called the commander over. Release the Sudan warriors. They will stand the watch over their own. They have proved their worth. Thank you, your majesty, the captain bowed. Make no mistake, captain. I am a fair man. But if even if even one of your men threatens or attacks a man, woman, or child of Hodon, I will execute ten at random. Do we understand each other? The king lowered his gaze so as to be eye to eye with the shorter captain. Clearly understood, your majesty. Harun blinked, swallowing hard. Good. Then get up and take control of your army, captain. We have work to do. The king stood, and everyone stood, and everyone rose. Two. The king stood, and everyone rose. Oris left their company to speak to his commanders, commanders alone. They were not pleased that they had been, that they were, they were, who? They were not pleased that there were armed Sudan within their encampment, but none dared to question their king's judgment. He was fierce but fair, and the men loved him for it. For the first time in many reigns, they would ensure that he would die of old age before anyone challenged him for the throne. The morning came, and the Hodon removed their embattlements, packing up their war supplies and setting the wagons to at the front and rear of the ragged group who were marching to the north. The Sudan did not complain surprisingly, but the Hodon made sure to stop frequently to allow for rest and water. Supplies were rationed due to the slower pace of travel and the fact that they had only planned for 1,000 Hodon troops. Oris used hunters who were regularly dispatched to augment the food supply, and he sent a rider to Erinsir calling, calling to Purin for immediate aid in wagons. After three days, the messenger arrived in Erinsir. Purin ordered the wagons to be loaded without delay and activated the Hisdraj Erinsir unit. They marched towards the last posi known position of the refugees and the Hodon Legion. They met Hodon near a small village, one or two days' ride from the northern Hodon border. About time, Islan, Oris called out mockingly. We got lost, Purin joked. Someone gave me bad directions. The Hodon scout looked at his king in fear. The king responded to his scout. Relax, boy, he is jesting. The guard let out a slow breath, saluting his king and returning to his unit. Oris rode up to Purin and hugged him like his, like his brother. Thank you for coming, my brother, Oris said seriously. This is bad. All right. Where'd I go? All right. Pure looked at the bloodied faces of men, women and children. He was disgusted. Who did this, Oris, and why? Gods know what. Gods know that Edenyog could not do this. Even and King Loris of Sinog would never do such a thing. Orcs, boy. Orcs, the king said with a straight face. Pure laughed and mocked, mocked. And dancing unicorns burned their villages. No, I am serious. He, he showed Purin the bag, and Purin's face went pale. Where did they come from, Purin asked, instantly worried about Adasser and the children. Ships from the offlands. Swick warned him, you're not that damned fool. He died for his foolishness, and now this, his people burn and are enslaved. I fear they come for us next, the king sighed audibly. Donic, Purin shouted. The minister rode up quickly. What, what is it, my baron? Take this down, seal the scrolls with a signet, and send one to Edenyog, Synog, King Swick, Torith, and Dornadalar. 
Donak nodded. Sudanyag in flames. Orc invaders found. Many dead and injured. Refugees traveling to Erinsir for asylum. Request immediate military aid. There is no time for negotiations. They come soon. We need to be ready. We are mustering our forces at the Hodon capital. King Oris is in agreement. Purin looked at Oris, and the king nodded. I hope those stuttering fools don't try to talk for months about uh, before acting. I fear that things will escalate quickly. Gods help us if they they have as many uh, armies as a Sudan captain estimated. Oris sighed again, looking southwest. Purin nodded silently and wishing he could warn of the disaster. He scrawled a note and handed it to a squire. Go to the baroness and give this to her. Hurry, and do not stop until you arrive at her, at her door. The boy saluted and rode away at a gallop. Purin looked to the south and saw the smoke off in the distance. He imagined the horde of evil moving north toward his wife and children. His nightmares had shown this to him repeatedly. He was genuinely <clears throat> afraid for the, of the enemy for the first time in his life. Excuse me, got to wet the old throat here. <clears throat> What's going on? Uh, in his reoccurring, reoccurring premonition, Purin stood, against, um, stood on a hill against a nameless black. His army, which was decimated, had made its last stand. The feeling of hopelessness and despair was palpable. But Purin's resol Purin resolved to stand for the people, even if it meant they should all die in the attempt. Later in his visions, Purin saw Adasser fighting in her own way. Her eyes were as coals as she defended her tr with her tree, defended her trees, as her their children were cowering in the stone cellar within their castle, along with the ladies in waiting and Arla, Purin's mother. He never saw the result of the event events, but also, but every time he woke from the dream, he was drenched in sweat and had a feeling of impending doom. Now he sat, and now he saw, the manifestation of his worst fear. While he was awake, it was coming, and now he knew the blackness was them. After a restless sleep, King Oris led the people northward to the barony of Erinsir. Purin left the detachment of uh, left the detachment of fifteen hundred Draj Erinsir to augment the Hodon forces. They were waiting for reinforcements from Swick. Athos arrived in Erinsir with three thousand cavalry. It was unexpected. Going to war without me, gentlemen? Truthfully, Purin had not thought of Athos. You are welcome to help defend against invasion, Baron Athos. Purin bowed. No need for that, Purin. Please never bow to me. Athos gave the or gave the order, and his unit was sent to augment Oris and Ho in Hodon. It looked as if Hodon was shaping up to have a decent deterrent, but the numbers by the report were still much too skewed in favor of the orcs. Both Purin and Oris doubted there were enough people on the earth to conscript an army big enough to deal with that with their threat. We may we may not be able to defeat them, brother. Oris admitted quietly to Purin, but we Hodon will die trying. Who will bleed the field red or black with their evil blood? I agree, brother. My life is forfeit for the safety of my family and my people. I will not rest until they are safe, even if it means my demise. Purin looked off to the north and could barely make out the, the castle, out his castle's uh, outline. His father, Dern, was commanding the Drajar and Seer, who remained behind with the Dasser. Purin had about 2,000 left to defend his home. Hodon had 7,500 soldiers. The king sent riders to the four winds. They lit the signal flare, flares and rode hard to every commander in the kingdom. By week's end, most had joined their king at the, his home in the small town of Warrior Cro Crossing where the Northern Alliance was born. There were 3,000 Carinian horsemen from the, hands, from the lands of Athos, 1,500 Draj from, Aaron, from Aaron Seer, 500 of which were bow, 500 of which were bowmen, and 500 uh, Sudan rebels armed with which, with what they could find. It was a formidable force for the nations of the earth, but not an adequate response to the armies attacking from the offlands. King Oris prayed to Rainier and Grenier, asking them to rain fire, the fire of the underworld upon his invaders. He also begged quietly for the help of, to help in saving his people. He doubted anyone was listening. The two brothers listened, the brother gods that is, and were intrigued by the lost cause of Hodon, the, the lost cause Hodon was about to embark on. Rhaenyra chose Oris as his champion, and Gunir chose Purin. The two brothers blessed their champions with strength and of, with the strength of several men and a godlike and godlike endurance. Both men immediately felt ready for anything, but both were afraid their deterrent would not be up to the task. The riders from Purin reached their destinations, and as to be expected, 
Synagogue pulled into the citadel and bolstered its own defenses. It responded to Purin's pleas with a simple one-line response, not interested in spending the lives of Sudan on uh, of a synagogue on Sudan dogs. Purin spat when he read the response. Cowards. Oris shook his head, muttering, I figured as much. Islandeth had the most soldiers of any kingdom, but King Swick overthought the whole endeavor, spreading his troops thinly along the Great White Wall. He dispatched 2,000 of his troops to Edenyog and sent another 7,000 to Purin, holding, the ba holding back 17,500 to protect his capital city. Purin shook his head in disbelief. The king of Islandeth expected to hold Empire with 17,500 troops against hundreds of thousands of invaders. <laughs> Sarantak had, Sarantak had better be on the ball, Purin thought, shaking his head. Still, 7,000 is better than nothing. The riders arrived in Edenyog too late. Swick's 2,000 reserves lay dead on the field, and Edenyog burned. The orcs swarmed over the Edenyog, uh, over Edenyog and, Eden could not, uh, the, and the Eden who could run then headed north as quickly as possible. Draj runners took notes from their surveillance, avoiding the orc patrols, and then rode hard to Ahodan to pass the news of Edenyog's fall. King Swick called an emergency meeting of his generals. Sarantak suggested evacuating the city of all non-essential personnel. Swick agreed, sending the criers to pass an edict that his people should flee to the north as best they could or make an attempt uh, or, or attempt to make it to Oran Fall Morindi. Swick hoped that Glorin would have room for his people. He knew that if he did, Glorin would not turn away his landeth. Swick then secretly called his queen to his planning room, where he was hurriedly trying to come up with a viable plan to defeat the new threat. Nothing was coming to him. The queen entered the room. Yes, husband, what is it? The queen asked, though she already knew what it was. Father, my sweet, he said, lowering his voice. There are two guards and a fast chariot at the re at the ready in the courtyard. Go to Purin or run to Torth. Get out of here. Sudnyag is in ashes and Edenyag burns now. We cannot win this war. Live, my love. Do not do as I, please do as I say. He looked haggard. He hadn't slept in days and had been drinking, Falda knew that this was the fulfillment of her, version, of, her, of her visions. It had all come to pass, just as she had seen it count, countless times before in her sleep. I will go to Aaron, sir, my king. I will aid Princess Adasser. She will need my healing if there is a war. The queen teared up. What of you, my love? What will you do? She already knew. She had seen his death. She had begged Haya to let this pass unfulfilled, but she now knew that it was not the will of the goddess. Hey, Stephen Ferrer, what's happening, my bro? Let's see. Uh, I will stand with my men. I must protect the kingdom. His eyes watered. He never thought it would come to this. With shaking hands, he touched Falda's face, knowing it was for the last time. My love, you have always been in my heart. I will wait for you in Eternum. At that moment, Swick knew he, could not, he would not gaze upon her face again, for this battle was suicide. Falda hugged him and sobbed, and sobbed, knowing it was their last hug. She kissed him as if for all eternity. Until we meet it until we meet again, my love, whether it be in this life or in the presence of the goddess, fall to turn and did not look back. Switch wa Swick watched her go. She would be safer with a dasser. The king king oh, I can't speak English, I swear. The castle was a prime target, and they could not hold it with what they had against what the intelligence cited. Swick prayed. Alright. Then it goes As Eden burned, the amassed allied army relocated near Erinsir where the soldiers sat and waited. Some began to question if the enemy was ever coming. It had been over two weeks since Sudanyag had been raised. The general consensus was, if the enemy had so many soldiers, what was taking them so long? Purin was in no hurry. He was about to ride to the castle and check the preparations for the 100th time when a rider burst, at full, burst into camp at full gallop. Jumping off his horse, he handed the scrolls to Purin and almost collapsed from exhaustion. A servant brought the squire some water while Purin broke the seal and read it. Oris waited for him to speak. With a look of mixed despair and disgust, Pure in hand the scroll to Oris. Oris read, Your Excellency, I regret to inform you that upon reaching the borderlands of north, north of Edenyog, we witnessed a great plumes of smoke rising from the villages and towns. People are seen fleeing the kingdom for Dornad Alar and Torith. Our scouts were able to determine that the invaders are indeed as described, dark clothed humans are orcs and goblins. They were at least there were at least fifty thousand enemy on the ground in Eden, by my estimate. Eden Yog has fallen to the enemy. No word on the condition of the royal family there. The situation is dire. Oris shook his head, then looked at Purin. This may be our finest hour, young my young brother, or at least our most trying. Oris laughed, handing Purin a flask. 
Puren took a swig and grimaced. It was hold on whiskey. They loved it, but it was a harsh drink as as there was as harsh a drink as they were pe they were a people. We have no choice. We are warriors. We serve the king, and in your case, you serve your people. We may we shall maintain our our, our honor and pray for mercy from the gods. Puren looked at the trees. Haya, please hear me. It was not Haya who heard him, but Rainier and Garnier. They listened intently, rubbing their mischievous hands together. The god brothers loved a good fight, and this one was shaping up to be an epic battle. They maintained their blessings on their champions. <clears throat> These two humans promised to be very entertaining warriors. Haya was preoccupied with another who had called for her attention, and the goddess was not watching her sons. <clears throat> In Erinsir, the people battened down their homes. They moved the livestock indoors and set up provisions in their cellars. The villagers tried to set up militia, but Purin would have none of it. He forbade anyone to throw away their lives. He knew men would be needed to would need to survive in order to carry on after this mess had resolved itself. In the castle at Erinsir, the Baroness had been reading her book over the years and practicing her arts. She became adept at controlling not only her emotions, but also but also her family of trees. When she heard of the impending attack, she called to the tree leaders, asking them to position themselves strategically in the path of where the enemy was most likely to advance. The trees complied, lying in wait. While, while learning how to be the Holy Mother, Adasser had spent many hours in meditation and prayer, so much so that many times her five-year-old son, Alari, would sit on his, on his own and pray to the goddess, which tickled Haya to no end. The three-year-old twins were busy chewing on things they were not supposed to and getting into everything. Arla managed them while Adasser tried to master her arts. Grandma did not mind. She loved to be around her grandchildren. Adasser had quietly grown in power. The only people who knew what she was truly capable of were Purin, Arla, Dern, and Alari, but none of them had seen everything. She tried to keep her arts to herself, but Alari followed her everywhere, around everywhere, always asking questions. She could not be annoyed because he was adorable and wanted to be helpful. She learned her her. He learned her ways as she practiced with him by her side. During her studies, Adasser uh, learned to speak to the trees and how to have them relay messages to their comrades anywhere in the earth. In this way, she could make a connection and see what was going on throughout through the perspective of a forest at any location on the earth. A side effect of the meditation was the fact that she became more attached to nature. She progressed from talking solely to trees to having a strange understanding with all animal life within her direct vicinity. <clears throat> Many times birds would perch on her while she meditated, or they would sit on the windowsill listening to her voice. This ability unnerved Purin at times because the Dasser had attracted one large snake and at times some very creepy looking ins insects. The animals and the forest could sense a Dasser's mood and her will. The forest would unquestionably do her bidding, but the animals could be a little less predictable in their actions. Sometimes they listened and helped. Other times they did as they pleased. Adasser had an idea. She would be helpful. She would. She decided to aid her husband, even if he didn't see it coming. As the horde approached, the trees looked more menacing than usual. More vines and jagged branches seemed to be appearing. Adasser's army had formed right under Purin's nose, and he hadn't noticed. Adasser wasn't going to tell him because she knew he would only try to stop her. He would figure it out soon enough, but by then it would be too late to stop her okay that's the second chapter i've read so basically the offlanders invaded the um, haruna uh harun ilanat who is a captain of the sudanyag resistance invaded the well infiltrated his own city killed the uh king the queen and two of the uh, uh the big the big wigs from the orc and uh, todesan and, and goblin army the offlander army and pissed them off, and they basically started burning the city to the ground and killing everyone and enslaving everyone they could get their hands on. So uh, uh, Harun took his uh, boys up north and purposefully pissed off the Hodon so they would capture them so that, excuse me, he could show the commander what was going on. Hey, what's up, Matt? So he could show the commander what's going on so that Hodon could maybe try to save them because they figured Hodon's strong and big. Well, we don't have anybody. Maybe they'll come down out of self-interest and stop these guys from, you know, killing off our people. So anyway, that didn't work out the way they thought because Hodon didn't have that many troops either. So they're looking down south and they see it. So he, Oris and Purin are friends now because of the the earlier part where Purin helped uh, feed the people in, in, uh, in Hodon. And now Oris runs to Purin and says, hey, 
there's a mess going on. I need you. So he comes down, you know, as a true ally, and he he contacts all the armies in the world when they figure out what's going on. So now, the uh, the army has taken over the the army of the offlanders, the evil, the scourge is basically what I call them. They've taken over Sudnyog. They've gone northeast through Edenyog and basically burned Edenyog to the ground. They don't have any idea what's up with the with the king and queen of that city uh, uh, or that kingdom or anything. And they don't. They think they're going to the east. So now this is the part where uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Oris and, and Purin are sitting around going, where the heck are these guys? Well, they think they're going to the east because Edenyog had just got uh, torched. And this is the, the last chapter I'm going to read tonight. It's one of my favorites. It's called The Queen of Nature. And this is this is probably my favorite chapter. And my second favorite chapter comes next week when we actually read the pretty much the end of the story and the aftermath. So The Queen of Nature... Um, I'll just go ahead and get to reading it. It is my favorite chapter in this book. And just to let anyone know, Adaster was not supposed to be um, anything special when I wrote this book. She was just going to be the, the the girl that drops the handkerchief, and he goes, ah, and giggles and everything else. Well, I had a dream one night when I was writing this book, and, I, and, and in this dream, I, I actually dreamt this chapter. So when I read it, it's par partially my dream and partially embellished. But I had a dream that Adaster was a badass. She wasn't just some eye candy little girlfriend and, 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 and she was just, you know, there to support the big tough guy. You know, she turned out to be somebody badass and she turned this story into something better. Um, so this is, like I said, this is my favorite chapter and I'm going to go ahead and read it before it gets too late because it's already been about an hour, but I've read a significant amount of the book so far and I'm going to read the last chapter. So, all right, here we go. I'll shut up about you know, commentary and read the story. The next chapter is called The Queen of Nature. The sudden destruction of two southern kingdoms concerned King Swick. Fearing for the, el the dwarves and the elves to the east, he sent riders to warn them. King Glorin and Bogrol did, uh, had seen the smoke and sent their own scouts earlier, so they were fully aware of the dangers that lurked to their southern borders. Glorin has declared a state of emergency, ordering all the elves within Torith to withdraw to the underground fortress at Oran Fel Marindi. It was an orderly migration. The enemy was still a way off, and the elves did not were not yet in a panic. The forest was thin, and the tree ring was barren, and it would not uh, provide adequate protection. The Holy Mother's health was failing, and she was becoming too frail to hold the trees in her presence. They were migrating to Erinsir against Adastra's wishes, but the mother knew it had to be so. The high priestess addressed her last remaining trees. My loves, I depart you soon. Grant an old elf a final wish before we say goodbye, will you? The trees rustled, some groaning. They were not pleased with her words. Be still, my trusted family. All that lives must end. I am no different. She is your queen now. I must diminish. I would ask that you relay the message that I will not see the morrow, for my time is full. Hyatt calls me home, and I am ready. The trees dropped flowers from their branches around the Holy Mother. She bent down, picking one up, smelling its fragrance one last time. She will lead you well, my children, for she is greater than I. She wields all forms and does not know her true potential. She see to it that she survives and preserve the people whom she loves, if you are able. She is a good girl, but foolish and strong-willed. She smiled, but she also possesses a true heart and a sharp mind. Respect her as you did me. The old woman hugged a tree and bowed. Lauren was watching as the old woman removed her headdress and looked to the sky with her hands up out and up and outstretched. Holy Mother of all that lives, I am ready. There was a bright flash of lightning and a clap of thunder where the old woman once stood. The ground was not scorched, nor was there a crater, but she was gone. Lauren looked to the sky and waved goodbye to his old friend and teacher. She was home. Then he looked out over the Raven's Pass towards Aslandeth, wondering what his daughter was up to. He had an idea of her intentions and prayed to Hyre to protect her from the enemy and from herself. Then Glorin departed with his, the remainder of his people to the underground fortress. The Draj remained behind within the, the remaining trees. They set up a defensive perimeter and awaited their doom. None of them expected to survive the engagement. The dwarves did similarly, moving their far farmers and much of their harvest, as, as much of their harvest as they could, into Dornat Alar. Then Borgral set his meager dwarfish armies outside of, of the immense granite doors to the city. 
the dwarf king ordered his men to defend the populace to their last breaths and wish them luck. He too asked for the blessings of Haya, but felt a cold chill run down his spine as he realized he was selling he was sealing their fates. He was sealing the fates of all those young soldiers by closing the great doors behind them. Frowning, he walked solemnly to where the refugees were gathering and con constructing their makeshift campsite. The king then spoke a few words of encouragement to his people before leaving to join his family. There was no celebrating by the crowds, only quiet talking in a nervous dark mood. The dwarves were sick of war. Islandeth manned the Great White Wall and sent troops at key points within the city of Ampere. Swick attempted to come up with a viable defensive plan to save the capital, but the best he could come up with was an evacuation plan and the ways to delay the inev inevitable. He was not optimistic, nor was Sir Antak, who was leading the who was leading their forces. The kings took solace in the fact that his love was in this errand seer with his most trusted barons surrounded by Hodon and Athos, who had become a key player in the defense of Islanda. Unfortunately, all of the preparations seemed too little and too late. Swick called for Master Reddy, and they prayed together in the monastery. The king burned offerings and prayed, uh, begged Haya for mercy, and then left to armor up. He rode out with Antak, joining his men, who were readying to die. They all resolved to meet their fates head on by trying to hide. Imagining how Falda would have screamed at him for his foolish pride, he smiled. He would make their deaths worth it. Something good would come from their sacrifice. Now the now the waiting began. The defenses were as good as they were going to get. All right. <clears throat> In Aaron's here, the trees had become so thick that they appeared to be a tightly made picket fence that was 30 feet thick. The gaps were so small that even a sword could not stab through the alignment. The trees had formed a circle 20 miles across with a castle situated in the center. Adassa's tree emplacements she had directed along the route of the enemy's likely travel appeared to those unaware to those unaware as small wooded glens. The enemy would not suspect anything. Her minions were lying in wait silently. While Adassa was preparing for war, she received a message through the, her link to the trees. No, she did not. Adassa trailed off and frowned and then nodded. She's gone, and am I the Holy Mother by default? Oh my gods, I'm not ready. I'm not worthy. She turned to the trees. They cowered in her presence because they could feel her displeasure. Is it true, my friends? They affirmed her thoughts. Then so be it, she relented. We must prepare. While speaking to her trees, a commotion occurred at the edge of her forest. The Draj were trying were the Draj were there to inter intercept the invaders. The Dasher saw them. They were they were more bloodied women and children. Uh, bloodied men, women, and children. They were running from the southwest. Then, then she saw the smoke past the canyons, realizing that these were Synog's people. A woman hysterically cried out for her child, who ran through the crowd to her. Scooping him up, she hugged him tightly while she wept, shaking. Adassa put her hand on the woman's shoulder, and she immediately calmed. Who are you? What has happened? Adassa asked, knowing full well what the woman was about to say. The evil ones. They broke down the citadel with their siege engines. There were so many of them. We ran through the rubble. So many are dead. The woman began shaking and crying. Adasser had heard enough. Trees, scout for me. Where are the evil ones? She asked calmly. The trees looked over the plains and saw that saw they were moving northwest from Sudanyag, towards where Purin and Oris were, up the west side of the canyon, directly towards Corin and Erinsir. Purin would be cut off and surrounded. Panicking, Adasser called for her ministers. Donix and the others had returned from the field long ago and were busy, were, were busy organizing supplies. Donnick ran to his baroness. What is it, your excellency? He, he asked and bowed. Until this is over, over, dispense with the formalities, my dearest friends. We do not have time for this for pleasantries. My tree scouts tell me that the enemy moves on the east and west of the canyon. This means that Purin and Oris will be cut off and surrounded. We must send word immediately. The refugees who, have, I, who I have spoken with and my trees estimate. Adassa looked at the tree. And it answered her, eight hours until impact, eight hours. Assemble the Draj, send 1,000 to Purin, and leave 1,000 here with me. My lady, that leaves you without adequate protection, Donick protested. Trust me, my friend, I have all I need, Adassar looked at the ring. The forest was getting busy now. Within the trees, wolves had, made, had come down in their packs. The mountain lions brought their prides. Birds of prey circled high over the ring, perching where they pleased. Erinsir was full of life in all of its menacing forms. No one saw Haya as she stood in the center of the ring, watching her priestess with interest. The goddess smiled. Once again, she had chosen wisely. Adassar ran into her castle after dispatching a rider to Purin. 
She did not know how far they were or if the Draj would reach them in time, but the warriors were needed outside the ring, not within it. Adasser found Arla, my dearest companion and constant friend. Please guard my children with your life. Take them below ground into the fortress that my wise husband built while others laughed at him. Provisions have been moved uh, <clears throat> within the fortifications. Do not come out for any reason until all is calm. I fear the end may be near, but I am confident that Haya will make a show of it. Best case, we all feast tomorrow in the forest green. Uh, worst case, I shall all see you at the gates. Haya was impressed by the elf's bravery and resolve. Do not joke about such things, daughter, Arla said as she choked back her tears. Adasser lift, lifted Alari and kissed him. Then he did the same with. Then she did the same with Altwitis and Elpis. The two younger children had no idea what was going on, but Alari was Alari was sensitive to the spiritual as as his mother. Mama, the evil comes. I wish to fight it. His little face twisted as and he picked up a stick. He was his father's son, but his mother's also. You will do no such thing, young man. Adasra scolded. Go with your grandmother now. Alari cried and protested. I want to see Haya, Mama. You are going to bring her here, aren't you? Adasser turned stunned. He saw. He had the sight. She hoped she would. She could talk to his little soul about what he saw when all when this was all over. If he if they survived, you can watch from a window, but not too close to the opening. Things may get out of hand, my little priest. Adasser scooped. Uh, Adasser stooped and kissed him on his tiny lips. Mother loves you, my big boy. Go. You are your father's son. Go now. Move. Arla swept, him, swept up the kicking and screaming Alari and the other two children, ushering them into the forest made of, made of six-foot-thick granite by the dwarves. Adasser turned and swallowed hard, trying to focus. She had less than eight hours before the end, but she was ready. <clears throat> All right, I'm continuing. All right. Adasser's rider found the Carinian cavalry riding southwest towards the smoke. They had cut across the Aaron Seer. Uh, they cut, a, cut across the Aaron Seer and were running parallel to the river that ran on the nor on the Hodon border. Athos was leading his men into the canyon in an attempt to cut off the enemy as it moved north towards his lands. It seemed that Purin and Oris had the same idea, and they all met at the Sinog border. Hordes of the enemy could be seen as far as the horizon as they moved north towards the Slandit. My lords, while well, the Baroness sought to warn you of the fall of Sinog, but apparently you are aware, the squire said sarcastically, looking over the field of endless enemy. Sinog's refugees are holed up in Erinsir. There were very few survivors. Purin and Oris nodded grimly. We must move north to counter their threat, brother, Oris said <clears throat> to Purin. How do we move without exposing this approach? <clears throat> Just then a goblin scout yelled something unintelligible and, marched, and the marching stopped. The goblin was pointing towards the alliance position, but Purin didn't think they had seen them yet. They have discovered this path. We must move back and allow them to come in, but we must not allow them to cut us off and limit our movement. Excuse me. Athos rode up between the two. Purin, allow me to take point. Athos had thousands of cavalry in the canyon. They would be effective, but not ideal. Then the student captain approached. We shall set a wall. Uh, Lord Athos can run the flanks. It is not ideal, but it will allow your forces to regroup on the other side towards Aaron, Seer, and Corrin. If all else fails, it buys you time to come up with a better plan. Harun spoke, spoke to his lieutenant and split his forces, leaving two, leaving 300 to Athos and, and led 200 to support Pirin and Oris. Athos, you do not need to do this, Pirin stated seriously. But I do, my friend. I must atone to Haya for my misdeeds and sins. I will aid her chosen in his purpose. She will honor my sacrifice. I will see you in a turnum at the table of heroes. We shall sup and drink wine forever. I will save you a seat and one for your lady. Being an elf, I fear we may have to wait upon her. He looked at Purin with a childish grin. He was happy. This was the, the chance he had waited for for almost 20 years. Haya nodded, smiling at the man who Athos had become. She called for his seat to be readied at her table, and Aloia made the, the, fresh, the preparations. <clears throat> Let me click here. Purin looked sadly at Athos. Athos, he had hated him for so long. Now the the man, this man was an honest soul, a good man. He was heading off to die. We will break bread in Eternum. Let it be known, in your heart, that I forgive you for that day. And with his final breath, breath, Master Elig also forgave you. I also ask you for for your forgiveness for holding my hatred for so long. You will redeem not only yourself but also your family name. And if I live, I will celebrate this day. And so will my people. 
Athos wiped the misty tear smiling. Until we meet in paradise, gentlemen. Oris and Purin solemnly saluted Athos and then turned quickly, had their commanders quietly pass the word to move north through the canyon to Aaron Seer. Purin looked up at the canyon top. Trees had appeared in small groups here and there. He smiled, wondering if they were up to something. It is reported by witnesses that Athos held his ground for three days before falling in battle to his wounds. His, milk, his men killed ten times their number and as the enemy movement was badgered by ill-tempered trees. Offlander commanders could not understand why they were unable to flank their opponents nor control the higher ground because everywhere they went, trees were in their way. Some orcs and goblins reported strange things happening within their units, uh, happening when their uh, orcs and goblins reported strange things happening when their units entered the glens that were located on the canyon ridges. Chariots were caught in vines and mysterious deaths occurred. It was general chaos, but despite their best efforts of the forest, the enemy eventually entered the canyon and made a straight line towards Hodon and Aaron Seer. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Purin and Oris had decided to make their way to the castle Aaron Seer, but when they reached the edge of the open field around the ring of trees, they saw the enemy had taken the advantage. There were too many. Knowing they could not engage them directly, Purin and Oris instead chose to push towards the grand gate of the, right, the Great White Wall in an attempt to circumnavigate the barony and come out on the northeast corner of it. Purin was encouraged by the way the trees were holding the line and hurried his men to cover and cover the open distance required. It took two days before they were able to get into position. Meanwhile, Adasser was dealing out chaos of her own creation. In the tree circle, Adasser stood with her, with her 1,000 remaining draj. 1,000 who had left who had left the the 1000 who had left her walked right into the onslaught that had came to her that had come to her do doorstep the fields were black with the enemy and they as they engulfed the the land surrounding the trees her trees reported they were orcs and goblins as far as the eyes could see adasser inquired of her friends as to the whereabouts of her husband and two hawks informed her that approximately 10,000 remaining draj and hodon forces had just arrived northeast of the barony Purin was leading them with oris she knew it. Those fools, what are they thinking? Glory and honor and a pig's ass. Adasser spat. These damn men and their delusions of glory. He will not be happy until my father is right. That son of a mule. Adasser was working herself up, but she did not care. She ordered her trees to Purin's location. And then the world slowed down for her. She did not know what was happening. Alari pointed from a window and shouted to his mother. She is here, mother. She is you, and you are her. Alari smiled with a glint of red in his tiny eyes. His mother's eyes were burning coals, and her hair had begun to float as if in water. Absentmindedly, as if it was just another, a regular moment, she smiled and waved to her son, calling him in an unnatural voice. Hide, Adasser said in an ancient tongue. Yes, Mama, the, God just, the goddess watches you, Alari replied in the same tongue. Adasser smiled wide and then laughed, unnerving her already worry soldiers. They had no idea what was going on. Adasser walked calmly to the center of her tree circle, where Haya already stood observing. Static popped between her locks, which were now silvery white. She looked out over her men, with blazing red eyes spying the orcs who came for her babies. The trees awaited her command. They stood tightly wound as the orcs tried to chop them with axes and burn them with fire. With an angry tone, she shouted to the trees. Alari was all she said. The trees pulsed, much like a shield, a shield wall of Purin's men. They thrust out 30 feet, engulfing the first rank, shredding the enemy instantly within the branches and vines. The second through the fifth ranks of the enemy were crushed by the impact of the tree trunks, and the sixth through tenth ranks were thrown 50 feet. Many die, dying when they hit the ground. Adasser's head was now lowered, and she looked. She was looking at the enemy front rank through the tree through the eyes of her of the trees. They were now turtling up and locking their shields, looking around with with bewildered faces. They wondered what sort of magic had just hit them. <clears throat> Adasser yelled at her second power word, shouting with authority, Elpis. Her daughter's name brought uh, a hail of birds of prey. The sky was filled with them. They swooped down, tearing at the enemy with relentless fury. From the, within the forest, the bull moose, elk, bear, lions, and wolves waded into enemy ranks, crushing or tearing to shreds anything that stood in their path. The attack lasted 20 minutes, and the enemy, with the enemy losing another five ranks of troops. The enemy dead totaled in the tens of thousands within 30 minutes of engaging Aaron Seer, with almost with another half of the of the that number injured. However, the enemy had plenty more in reserve. 
The enemy countered with the catapults in a full shield, shield wall charge. The trees were knocked down and the ring adjusted, filling in the holes in its defenses just as in, just as in Taurus. The enemy began to stack their own dead, climbing climbing over them in an attempt to move over the trees, vice through them. While mildly successful, they were destroyed by the drage while a dasser attacked for the third time. She cried to her forest, Outwit us. The old forest groaned and cracked. Vines shot out and grabbed the enemy forces as they advanced, dragging them into the trees where they were cut to shreds by spear-like branches. The enemy, who were still scaling their dead, were impaled as they climbed. The evil withdrew, but some had made it over the tree ring. Three made it to where Adasser stood. My lady, the commander, shouted at Adasser, but she was not listening. An, an orc shot an arrow that found a young girl who had wandered out of the keep. Motionless, the girl fell to the ground, and Adasser's eyes turned from red to black as coal. She saw her daughter's face in the girl. This will not do, she said. The orc charged Adasser, and the, and the drage were too far to intervene. As if she were dealing with a common pest, Adasser raised her hand, suspending the orc in midair. He clutched at his throat and gurgled as if, she, as if he was being choked. Then there was an audible snap as Adasser swept her hand towards the trees. And the enemy flew through the air where he was grabbed by waiting vines, never to be seen again. The two remaining orcs looked at each other fearfully. This witch is too powerful, brother. We should run, one said to the other. Adasser bent down and pulled the arrow from the child's neck. Prayed quietly, and the wound closed. Wake, young one, she said, cradling the girl's tiny face. Adasser guessed she was only five or six years old. The orcs had sat paralyzed with fear, deciding what to do. The draws were coming. The little girl woke as if from a dream, smiling and hugged Adasser, whose eyes had returned to their golden red. I saw the gates, my lady, she said in a tiny voice. They are beautiful. Mom and Dar are there now. Adasser teared up. They will wait for you, young lady. Adasser saw that Alari was standing outside, and she was not amused. In an irritated voice, she ordered, Go with my stubborn son and seek Arla. Go. Alari ran up, kissed his mother, and ran away. Adasser stood, turning back towards the orcs with a bored expression on her face. You shall die now, pigs. She thrust an open hand, uh, thrust and, thr excuse me, she thrust an open hand out, and one of the orcs flew backward until he impacted a well. He had a large hand-like impre impression on his chest when he fell limp on the ground, and his and his innards burst from the impre the force of the impact. Adasser glared at the other or orc who was now looking for a place to run to. There is no place to go. You came to me, fool, Adasser hissed. She put her hands together and then opened them forcefully. The orc exploded as if torn in half by in an instant. Adasser walked through the carnage she had just she had caused, looking to her trees, which were standing by for her orders. My loves, kill anything. Uh, kill at will anything not of my people. Protect my fool and of a husband and his idiot friend, please. The trees swayed in acknowledgement of their orders and commenced to killing everything within their grasp. The ground was blackened by orc and goblin blood. Adasser, not surveying the situation, was distracted by the chaos of her draj, <clears throat> who were now engaging an additional 100 or so orcs who had somehow survived the wall of trees and animals, only to regroup in front of Adasser's defenses. Adasser's, Adasser ordered the draj to hold the portcullis, stepping in front of her lines. But my lady, I cannot leave you alone with these animals, Dern pleaded. He would not betray his son's wife. Smiling, Adasser touched the commander's shoulder. As you wish, my protector, send your men, uh, send your men but you may stay. Dern sent his men to the portcullis. They closed it and stood guard inside. Adasser stood in front of the 100 or, or, or more orcs, as many of them laughed at her. They were not privy to what had, who was controlling the trees or what had happened near the well. Dern knew they were overconfident, smirking. He wondered how his son's wife would dispatch, dispatch this brood. How dare you come to my house and threaten my family, pigs, Adasser said in an ancient tone. The trees were in a fury. The frenzy of killing was at a peak, and they were as, de they were as deadly as they were beautiful. So was their queen. In, in kindest fury our culminar, Adasser spoke words she did not know, but knew in her heart. She made a fist above her head and pulled it down before her face. Fire rained down from thin air above the orcs. A sulfur stench filled the air as the orcs tried to run in all directions, but they were consumed by the heat of the fire. Adasser opened her hand, and the fire dissipated, leaving a circular reminder that it had happened, and 100 or so sets of orc bones were found laid in formation in memoriam. Adasser chuckled. She was starting to have fun. The priestess swooned after the fire attack, and Dern knew something was wrong. 
He reached out and caught her before she fell. Her hair was still white, but slowly regaining, uh, but slowly regained its natural black color. Her, the red was fading from her eyes, and she had a far-off look on her face. The Baroness did not seem completely coherent. I guess perhaps I overdid it for my first time, my protector. Adasa produced a weak smile, and during her commander, her drash commander, carried her to a shaded area near a tree which had moved itself to the center of the yard. He called for some water, and a drage brought a canteen. Thank you, gentlemen. I shall be all right. The draw soldier handed, soldier handed the Baroness a wedge of cheese and a small loaf of bread from his pack. She ate. That is much better. Thank you. She rested. All, all was quiet for the moment, and the orcs were in disarray. Dern looked around at the carnage in disbelief. The goddess was definitely with a dasser. He could, would never look at a tree in the same light. The orcs and goblins had no answer for the trees. The witch was handing them a sound defeat. No number of troops seemed to matter. The initialist estimates of the Offlander command stated that the witch, her trees, and the swarms of animals had killed at least 65,000 troops and wounded another 50,000. Many would not recover from their wounds. The dead would increase by a large margin by morning. One spy stated that he could see one elfish witch and a legion of elfish warriors holding back the glorious for forces of the Offlander king. The high commander was livid and had his senior field captain executed for dereliction of duty. He promoted his lieutenant with a stern warning that failure would not be tolerated. Still, the general realized that the witch was a formidable foe for which he had not planned. they had not planned. The orc general worried he was spending too many of his men in this, on this small patch of land. He knew he had plenty of troops, but, there, but there, these humans had put up a decent fight, killing about 100,000 troops between the meager forces of of the three southern kingdoms he knew the northern king uh, between the 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 oh wait a minute so let me reread that one he knew that he had plenty of troops but these humans had put up a decent fight killing about a hundred thousand troops between the meager forces of the three southern kingdoms he knew that the northern kingdom was by far the largest and his spies reported that the humans in the north possessed three times the forces they had encountered to the south if the northern kingdoms killed at the same rate as the southern kingdoms, the, ki the general estimated he would be facing the warriors of Torith and Dornad Alar with scarcely 150,000 men remaining. He knew with this number it was not inconceivable to lose. Aaron Seer had bloodied the nose of the enemy and bled them dearly. The orc intelligence could not determine how many warriors awaited them under the two mountain fortresses of the elves and dwarves. The orcs had to be conservative now. There was still much to land to cover and many people to conquer. The elfish witch is more than we bargained for, sir, the new commander said plainly. If we continue down this path, we will be severely weakened and unable to com complete our mission. Reinforcements will take years to acquire, sir. We must think of a way into the tree wall or go around. Go around. That is a sound idea. We shall go around them to the northwest. We are sure to encounter pockets of resistance, but these armies are, but these armies are foolish enough to but if these armies are foolish enough to engage us in the open field, we will crush them. Their commanders will know this. Look for them at choke points and avoid giving them the advantage. We must route the remaining resistance. Once we have secured the lands, we shall revisit this elfish bitch. We, I will use her as my concubine if I, until I tire of her, and then I will put her body on a stake, decorating the entrance to her castle. She will pay, the general growled angrily. The orc and goblin commanders called out in, guttural, in a guttural language to their units. They formed up, marching away from the tree line to, the, to a distance to, at which they felt safe. Adasta saw their, their retreat from her, from her seat near the tree, smiling with satisfaction. I will make you bleed again if you come within reach of my family, child, husband, or tree kind. The Draj helped Adasta as she staggered into the portcullis. She was weakened and seeming more like a frail, frail princess than the force of nature she had been an hour before. None of her men died because of her ferocity in battle, and Adaster's trees were none the, uh, the worse for wear. The animals patrolled in herds and packs and prides. A new ally arrived in the dark. The field outside of the forest was filled with biting insects and snakes. Adaster laughed, speaking to the trees. Excellent job, my loves. Please protect my husband and his band. Form a protective circle where they lie. Let him know that I love him and I think about him. Give him a tree lily from his family, from his lady. The tree swayed again as it began to rain. Ah, thank you, Aloea goddess. Please give them a muddy, bug-ridden bed in which to wallow in tonight. Sleep, my lady, Donick said, bringing a lantern to the bar baroness. 
Please come inside and get warm. Rest. Tomorrow's another day. I fear they will still be there when we awaken. You are correct, Master Donick. I will sleep now. Commander, you have the watch, Adasser said, sounding like her husband. Durin smiled at his daughter-in-law. He saluted. Yes, Your Excellency. Sleep well. The Draj used elfish camouflage and hid within the friendly trees, knowing that there they would be ten times more effective and privy to things that humans could not see in the dark. The trees did not need eyes to see. To the northwest, the orcs dispatched a scout unit that had come to the northwest. The orcs dispatched a scout unit unit that had come around to check out the route towards Empire. Oris cut their escape, killing any stragglers on sight. None of their knowledge made it back to the enemy lines. Oris and Purin split their forces, setting up a cold camp on either side of a farm road leading toward the capital. The men all went to sleep in open fields within tall grass, waking to their surprise in a copse of trees maybe a quarter of a mile in, uh, maybe a quarter mile in diameter. No one remembered the trees in the area. No one remembered trees in the area at sun uh, at sundown the night prior. Oris rubbed his eyes in confusion, unnerved instantly at the appearing forest. Purin, wake up! Dark magic is upon us. Oris yelled from ac uh, across the road. Shh, Oris, they will hear you, oaf. What are you yammering on about? Purin woke disoriented, covered in tree lilies. They were Adaster's favorite flower. He picked one up and breathed in its fragrance with a deep breath. Smiling, he knew it smiling, he knew it was her. What in the underworld is going on? Why do you smile? Oris questioned. Purin rolled over, brushing off the flowers gently and putting his hand on a tree. Good morning, he said calmly to the tree. Please tell my love that I am fine and thank her for the flowers. Also, thank you for coming, my friends. Purin talked to the trees, and they swayed. On the other end, the trees were elated when Adasser giggled and hugged the ancient elm she sp often spoke with. It had just passed Purin's message. My beloved idiot is still alive. We, will, we shall have our hands full with that one, elm. He is a hero, and he is a man. They tend to do stupid things. Thank you for your vigilance. Adasser stood and walked over to the guard. They were working on a half a night's sleep, but there was no sign of an orc or goblin incursion since the carnage the day prior. The old elm spoke to Adasser, informing her that the evil ones appeared to be withdrawing and moving to the northwest clockwise towards where her beloved was. Adasser thanked the elm and informed the Draj. They found an old elfish scout who had immigrated from Torith and asked him to find Purin and warn him. He agreed without hesitation. Remember, brother, you have no time. They will be upon him within two days. Take a horse and ride hard to the cosps, cosp, cops, 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 something like that. To the cops in the middle of the open field. I think they are there. She turned to the elm who confirmed. Yes, it is sure they are there. I will tell them. I will let them know or die in the attempt, Holy Mother, the elf replied. The Dasser's eyes widened. She had forgotten who she was now. She was a spiritual leader of the elves by default. They looked at, they looked at her as the direct representative of nature and of the goddess. After yesterday's display, no one doubted her. They knew who she was without a formal introduction. The rider reached Purin a half, half a day before the, the enemy arrived. He and Oris rested their soldiers in the cover and protection of the woods. The cops thickened up around the edge, making it hard to see anything within the trees. The orcs approached unaware, avoiding the trees and considering the field as open and without resistance. They did not see Purin and Oris, and the two liked it that way. Their unwanted guests would see them soon enough. And that is the the queen of nature. That was the chapter where Adasser shows what she can do. I've read, wow, I've read three chapters and it's been an hour and 38 minutes. The last chapter, there have two more chapters in this book, I believe, is all there is, and then there's an epilogue. So basically next week we're going to finish the book. It looks like next Wednesday. Uh, basically, I think I can do it. Yeah, it'll be a little, it's going to be a little long, but I can do it. Um, there's two chapters at the end. One of them is called uh, The Return of the Champions, and the other one is called The uh, Battle of Arendare. Battle of Arendare is the big, the big, it's the climax of the story. So where we're at in the book right now is, okay, the offlanders have attacked. They've taken over pretty much Ednyog, Sudnyog, and Sinog. They've, uh, they've killed off Oris and his 3,000... Uh, uh, what do you call it, the Corinian, uh, what do you call it, uh, horsemen, I can't say, a cavalry, that's the word I'm looking for, 
and they've made their way towards Erinsir, and they figured they're going to roll into Erinsir, cut some trees down, and go kill all these people in Erinsir, and then Adasser pulled their punk card and beat the crap out of them. So basically, they lost a ton of guys. Since taking over Edenyog, Sudenyog, Synog, and trying and not successfully doing anything to Edenyog, I mean, excuse me, Erinsir, they've lost over 100,000 of their troops, but they have probably two or three thousand, two or three hundred thousand, maybe 400,000 troops. I can't remember. Yeah, I used to know all the numbers off the top of my head, but anyway, they've got a buttload of them left. So right now they're coming around uh, the uh, the barony of Aaron's here and headed towards uh, uh, Is Islandeth. Uh, well, they're in Islandeth. They're headed towards Empire, the capital of Islandeth, where Swick and Antok are waiting, and that's where the Battle of Erendir happens. Battle of Empire happens, uh, and then the rest of the uh, combat sequence is there, and then the main battle. And I don't want to talk about it because I'll, I'll just ruin the end of the book. But anyway, uh, the main battle happens, and then the return of the champions is the aftermath of everything. So if you want to know what happens the, at the end of the book, it's going to be next uh, Wednesday from 7 to 9. I will finish the, the book, and hopefully I'll be able to start talking about uh, the sequel in The Shadow of the Great White Wall, which happens basically during the Champion's Return book, uh, chapter, right after the, uh, what is it called, The Return of the Champions, The Return of the Champions, which is the last chapter in the book. So the next book happens right at the end of that chapter, and there's a little part in there before the epilogue where they all die and they go to heaven, blah, blah, blah. Well, this book was supposed to be a solo endeavor. I wasn't supposed to write anymore. People started saying, well, you need to write another one. So I did. Okay, so I had to fit it in there so that, you know, they weren't, you know, because I, I killed everybody off. I didn't kill everybody off. Uh, everyone dies because they're mortals. So what I did is I wrote the book from the time of the end of this story to when they all pass away. So anyway, um, for, you know, lack of being able to tell you anything without ruining the story for the rest of well, the rest of the book. Um, let's just say the next chapter is a pretty good chapter. It's the climax. And then the return of the champions is pretty uh, pretty good, too. I like that chapter, too. The last two chapters of this book, I had fun writing. So anyway, uh, so anybody have any questions or concerns or anything like that? Anything they want to talk about? Because it's about an hour and 40 minutes in. And uh, it seems like I'm doing pretty good with this. Uh, I just read about 50 more chat, uh, 50 more pages. I mean, so all right, anybody? All right, well, um, no, that's about it. That's all I got. Anybody got anything else? Going once, going twice. All right, well, thank you all for coming out tonight and listening to me stutter my way through my book. And hopefully next week I will finish it up and we'll talk about In the Shadow of the Great White Wall where it should be available hopefully next week or the week after on all the major outlets, uh, Amazon, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Barnes & Noble. And if you're overseas and you're reading or want to read the book, you can find it on bookfinder.com because it's, you know, it's going to be sold internationally. Uh, I'm hoping to figure out a way to drop the price of this book since the new one's out, and it looks like the price point on the hardcover, unfortunately, is going to be somewhere around $20.99. And that's as cheap as I can go because it's 474 pages long. I think it's 463 pages of, of actual story, and then there's all the front matter and end matter. So it's like 474 pages. According to um, Ingram Sparks, the story's 463 pages. This book's 380 pages long. Um, so... It tells you it's longer, and uh, I think it, I think the story goes pretty well, and it definitely ties into this. If you haven't read this book and you try to read the second book, you can read the story, but you won't know the background. You won't really you you can read the story and understand it. It kind of could stand alone a little bit, but you don't know the background of who the heck Purin is or who Adasser is and why they have these powers and blah blah blah. So this one here is definitely the first one. You would definitely need to read this one if you want or listen to these videos before you read the second one. So, all right. Well, thanks to everyone for coming out. I'm going to cut it and uh, 
let you all continue with your night. I hope you have a great night, and I hope to see you next week. And we'll finish up the book, hopefully. All right. right, Y'all have a great night. And uh, bye.